is stunning. He says it in Caesarea Philippi, right at the foot of a big cliff, a big rock, uh, at the escarpment of Caesarea Philippi, uh, a, a town named after Caesar, and uh, uh, two levels down, or one level down, I guess, in those days in the uh, bureaucracy of the Roman Empire, Caesarea Philippi, Caesar and Philip. Who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the liberating king, the son of the living God, as opposed to Caesar, who is seen as the son of the gods. I mean, it's all so you know, extremely political. Uh, uh, and, and there, uh, uh, Jesus is there. Jesus declares, on this rock, I will, whatever the rock, we can argue about that, but I will build my ecclesia my colonies and my alternative way of living. Um, and so he's the head of the body politic. He's the head of this alternative community. He's the firstborn, the be uh, he's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. In other words, he's the resurrection of humanity. He is, we know that this empire is going to crumble. He's the resurrection of a new way of living. And so in everything he has in the first place, for in him all the fullness, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. God was pleased to reconcile all things to himself, all things on earth, all things in heaven. By, and here is the complete overthrow of Caesar Augustus, who makes peace by shedding his enemy's blood on the cross. But here is a king who makes peace through his own self-giving on the cross. The, the repudiation and overthrow of the empire around them. That's what they sang. We don't sing songs like that today. Because our imagination hasn't been freed up to imagine what it would be to be singing songs that, that bespeak this alternative kingdom of God in today's world. What would those songs look like? What would happen if we sang them? And uh, that to me is a pretty exciting possibility. Uh, so and when we sing of Christ as the image of the God who can't be seen, we're singing something pretty amazing. We, we looked at a definition of empire yesterday, and I, I was somewhat polite because I didn't take it any farther than, than just those general definitions. But there's a document widely disseminated in the 1990s uh, by the, I believe, the executive branch. Uh, and they, they, it was called the National Security Strategy of the United States. And they identified three main goals of U.S. Uh, security strategy. Perpetuate U.S. military dominance globally so no nation can rival or threaten the U.S. This is in the 1990s. Uh, be, be prepared to engage in preemptive military strikes. This is in the 1990s. George Bush gets blamed for a lot of things that were actually cooked up during the Clinton years. Uh, maintain immunity for U.S. citizens for prosecution by the International Criminal Court. Why that was identified as key, I don't know. But you know that one of your esteemed professors here has been involved in research about torture done by the U.S. government. And um, we've had our former president and former vice president brag about things that if they were anywhere else would make them liable to the ICC. But this was articulated in the 1990s, before President Bush and Vice President Cheney, that one of our goals was to maintain uh, uh, some sense of unaccountability. In other words, dominate, intimidate, and refuse to play by the rules you expect everybody else to play by, a classic manifesto of the imperial spirit. And we mentioned yesterday that empires always go through a rise and a fall, and there's no single a pattern for it, but you might say that empires always overexpand, or they have overexpanded, and now new conditions arise that make their current expansion unsustainable, which requires excessive taxation, which leads to economic stagnation and recession, which promotes expanding income inequality, which produces decreased well-being. By the way, inequality produces a lack of well-being for the rich as well as the poor. This is so well proven now. If you, there's if you want to read a book on this, it's called Spirit Level, written by healthcare professionals who study when you live in a community where everybody's poor, or you live in a community where everybody's rich or everybody's <coughs> middle class, you can measure differences in health between a community where you have a rich uh, minority and a poor majority in a big uh, 
spread. It's just fascinating. Uh, you, you can't talk about this today. You're called a socialist. Um, uh, which, by the way, isn't it ironic that people get blamed in today's culture for talking about wealth distribution, redistribution, when the fact is, over the last 30 years, we've had massive wealth redistribution by the existing tax code and the existing corporate policies and all the rest. You can't talk about it because that will expose what's the, the, the wealth redistribution that's already going on. It's just amazing. Uh, but inequality, uh, which then stimulates, uh, uh, which leads to decreased well-being, which stimulates crime, division, unrest, and you could just see the, the, the whole thing play out. Um, uh, when you think about this, you, you recall Alfred Nobel, who in 1866 invented dynamite. He called it security dynamite, in hopes that it would be a tool of violence so terrible that it would bring peace. I hope to discover a weapon so terrible that it would make war eternally impossible, he said, 80 years later, bombs fell. So when we invent these weapons that we think are too terrible to use, of course, eventually we use them. One recalls the name of Dwight Eisenhower, a man who knew something about war, a uh, Republican. I just uh, hope Republicans will listen to Dwight Eisenhower. It happens that defense is a field in which I've had very good experience over a lifetime, and I've learned, if I've learned anything, is that there is no way in which a country can satisfy the craving for absolute security. But it can easily bankrupt itself morally and economically in attempting to reach that illusory goal through arms alone. Um, so this is the condition of our security system today, especially here in the US. The eyes of the rest of the world are craving for absolute security has already driven us to the brink or beyond the brink for many of moral bankruptcy. Uh, how much of, by the way, I was, I was in uh, uh, Chile uh, a few years ago in South America. I happened to be there on September 11th. September 11th is a big day in Chile, not because of, uh, it was a big deal before 2001, because that was the day that our government overthrew their democratically elected government. Uh, so they remember September 11th for very different reasons uh, than, than we do. Um, uh, how much farther will our addictive craving for security through domination drive us? Will it drive us to back up to our economy? Will it drive us to the ledge of civilizational suicide through global nuclear war? We should hope and pray for, pray for the former. In other words, wouldn't you agree we would be better to have our country go out of business than to blow up the whole world in its last desperate gasp for security? Or else we should hope and pray for a radical transformation of our framing story so that we switch sides from Caesar's way to Jesus' way before it's too late. If it weren't for my faith in God, I would conclude that it's already too late, that the moment for transformation has long passed. Yeah, and, 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 you know, it would be bad enough if it was just the U.S. and our crumbling empire, but according to the U.S. Congressional Research Institute, the five members of the U.N. Security Council, U.S., Russia, Great Britain, France, China, permanent members, Cornered the market on global arms exports in 2004 uh, with an impressive 86.7% of market share. Um, the term security racket may come to mind. It described as a kind of security council. If you add other European nations to the mix, the figure rises to 93%. But if you take all the rest of the world's weapon sales and pull, put them together, they don't match U.S. weapons exports. Uh, my country proposed that we produce 53.4% of the world's weapons. Most Americans are either uninformed by these figures, apathetic, or perhaps they believe that McNamara was more rational. McNamara had a policy of selling weapons to our enemies to make money. Um, uh, it was more rational than President Jimmy Carter who in 1976 said we cannot have it both ways. We cannot be both the world's leading champion of peace and the world's leading supplier of arms. Those words were read earlier today. It gets worse. Some people, not enough, rightly complain about U.S. government subsidies for agriculture, but the number two recipient of government subsidies after agriculture is the weapons manufacturing industry. This is almost never talked about. Perhaps we Americans could say that this kind of welfare for the weapons industry is rational because this is the way we help our allies and make a profit while doing so. But in 2003, 80% of the top buyers of U.S. weapons were countries which our own State Department labeled undemocratic countries or countries known for their failure to uphold human rights, such as Egypt and Saudi Arabia. In 1999, U.S. weapons industry supplied arms to 92% of the conflicts in process anywhere on the planet, and in a stroke of elegant fairness, often supplied both sides of the conflict. 
Perhaps most shocking and awful of all between 98 and 2001, U.S. Great Britain and France earned more income from selling weapons to developing countries than they gave those developing countries in aid. So you start to see that behind the scenes, why all of us, when we think of America, we think of apple pie, and we think of you know, all the baseball and all these sort of things, the rest of the world sees a different side of our behavior. I was with a pastor in uh, El Salvador a couple of years ago. And he has, uh, he's, he's a Pentecostal, prosperity gospel pastor who's gotten the message of the kingdom of God. And he's trying to preach it in El Salvador. And I was sitting with him in his office and I said, what, he said, our first step in trying to apply the message of the kingdom of God, he said, it's very symbolic. But he said, we started the first recycling center in the whole country. And sure enough, on Sunday, People come with a Bible in one hand and they're recycling a bag full of plastic and other things. And they even started composting and they bring their compost stuff. And, and he said, you know, this won't change the world, but it's a first step. It's a way that we can live out our, our, uh, our faith and our understanding that God cares for all of life. And I said, well, what do you think? It, what's your next step? And he got silent for a moment. And he was being said, very, very gentle human being. He said to me, you might not know this as an American, he said, but your country was fighting a proxy war in my country for a long time. You were fighting the Russians. And as a result, both you and the Russians were arming my country. As a result, there are now four guns for every man, woman, and child in El Salvador. He said, we are awash in guns. And he said, there's something funny about guns. As soon as you have a few, you need more. You have one in your bed, you have one in your desk, in your office, you have one under the seat of your car, and then you also need one, and he just started adding, and so everybody gets more and more guns. He said, we are addicted for buying guns. And he said, I have to have armed guards surrounding my church, walking the streets, because otherwise, all the, our cars will be robbed and our people will be robbed to and from their cars. He said, I hate this, it's wrong. He said, so I know that my next, um, the next project is I have to speak about violence in the arms trade. And then he got quiet for a moment. He said, but I have small children. And you see, most of our political leaders are arms dealers themselves. So when I speak about this, I have to be prepared to die. He said, remember, this is the country of Oscar Romero. And so you just realize that we have this, we, we end up in this process of becoming so obviously suicidal, and then we just step harder on the gas, especially when you can win an election by being more extreme than the other guy. And, uh, and so we're watching this happen. We do it every four years. And, um, and so we find ourselves looking at the at two great empires of the 20th century. Uh, one, Great Britain, who divested voluntarily of its imperial status between World War II and uh, the 1970s, and the Soviet Empire, which collapsed with amazing speed uh, just 21, 22 years ago. Uh, and um, it makes you wonder, how will we play this out uh, as, as the only, the, the last man standing, so to speak, uh, in the category of superpowers, how will we play it out? And I think we have two options as a nation. One is to redefine our place in the global neighborhood and economy from an empire playing the role of police, boss, or bully to a good neighbor. How could we intentionally change our role to a good neighbor? A powerful neighbor, a rich neighbor, a strong neighbor who has special responsibilities, but it's very different to behave in the neighborhood like a good, strong neighbor and a uh, boss, police, or, uh, or bully. Um, or if that doesn't happen, we have to prepare for collapse because we have been just dancing the Arthur Murray Dance Studio steps uh, that, that, uh, that uh, an empire uh, uh, dances. 